What I wanted to have you on today about was I'm doing this long series on World War II, a revisionist look, and we did a we did a quick overview of the Weimar Republic, and nobody can really talk about the rise of the National Socialists without looking into what happened in the Weimar Republic after World War One. So uh, when you take into account what Prussia was and then what it became after the Treaty of Versailles, starting with World War I, um, how do you see it progressing to where and what Weimar became? Well, I think we have to start uh, with the uh, instigators of the war, and that they were the English, uh, specifically Winston Churchill and Lord Grey. The, the fundamental pillar of uh, ang ang the uh, British foreign policy is the Mackinder thesis, which states that if you control the Eurasian landmass, you control the world. And uh, that meant you had to block up any unification of the Eurasian landmass. So uh, the Kaiser made uh, the fatal mistake of uh, uniting Germany. Uh, that happened in 71. Bismarck became his chancellor. Uh, at this point, they um, consolidated a, the workforce. And since labor is the source of all value, they became a powerhouse. And by 1910, they had surpassed uh, England as the most productive uh, nation in the world. At that point, the Kaiser started making overtures uh, with Russia, and he started building battleships, which contested, which would contest Britannia's rule of the waves. And at this point, um, Churchill and Gray lured uh, Germany into a war. Uh, that war uh, was fought to a a standstill, uh, but uh, at a certain point, the uh, the Jews got involved. They promised England that they could win the war uh, they, uh, because they were going to get the Americans involved. The Americans then got involved uh, uh, because of a combination of uh, factors, including blackmail of President Wilson, and basically uh, helped uh, turn the tide. Germany at this point still has some notion that they were, they were dealing with civilized people, civilized countries. You know, Britain uh, never felt that way. And so after Germany signed the armistice, uh, Churchill blockaded the ports and starved hundreds of thousands of Germans to death. This made an enduring impression on um, the German people and on one German in particular, namely Adolf Hitler, who felt that Germany had been prostrated, stabbed in the back, and basically had been left uh, stripped uh, forced to pay uh, uh, an onerous indemnity that was guaranteed to cause resentment. The other thing that happened during this period of time was that basically the uh, the Germany in its helpless state was now being a, a prey to a different group of Jews. These were the Jews who uh, had basically taken over the Soviet Union. I'm sorry, taken over Russia and created the Soviet Union in 1917. And they were determined to take over the rest of Europe as well. And so what you saw at this period of time was the creation of the Soviet Republic of Bavaria and the Soviet Republic of uh, Berlin. The Bavarian Social Republic is much more important for our purposes uh, because there was a strong reaction there. Uh, after uh, it was installed, the nuncio to the uh, Germany, uh, a man by the name of Eugenio Pacelli, uh, who would go on to become Pope Pius XII, made a visit to the Wittelsbach Palace, and he wrote back uh, a letter to the Vatican because he was the diplomat. It was his duty to do this. And he said, the, uh, the uh, Soviet Republic of Bavaria is basically, uh, it's a bunch of Russian Jews. It has nothing to do with Germany. Uh, basically, the Russian Jews are taking over our country. Uh, over their country. Uh, this was later used as uh, an example of Pius XII's anti-Semitism by Daniel Jonah Goldhagen, who once had a reputation but obliterated his own reputation by the crappy books he wrote. Uh, but it was true. It was not only Pacelli that knew this, the Germans knew this. There was basically a Jewish plot to take over Germany, destroy it in its moment of weakness, and the name of those uh, Jewish plot was Bolshevism. Everybody at that time, everybody. And this was substantiated by <laughs> Johannes Rogala von Bieberstein's book, 
Yiddish Bolshevismus. Everybody at that time understood that Bolshevism was a Jewish messianic political movement that was determined to take over the world. So at this point, the uh, Bavaria, which is a Catholic country, suddenly found its uh, identity and the um, National Guard for the state of Bavaria uh, basically marched on Munich, the capital of Bavaria, and took it back, took it back from the uh, Jewish Bolsheviks who had taken it over. Now, this left a lasting impression on Adolf Hitler, who was there during this time and watched it firsthand. He had been in the First World War. He watched this firsthand. And he saw basically Germany being taken over by these forces. Now, when the overt political force failed, you had Kultur Bolshevismus, a cultural attempt to take over uh, Germany. And that was also Jewish. And I'm talking specifically about uh, Magnus Hirschfeld, uh, a Jewish, uh, he goes, I guess people call him a sexologist, whatever that is. Uh, a scientist who was claiming that he was going to talk about sex in a scientific fashion. And it created in Berlin an institute called the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft, or the um, Institute for Sexual Science. Uh, this attracted a lot of attention. Uh, it confirmed a lot of what the Germans felt about Jewish subversion at this time. And the Nazis and National Socialists were made a, a big uh, uh, a big play about about this. It also attracted foreigners, and one of the foreigners it attracted was Christopher Isherwood, uh, an English homosexual who showed up. And after about five minutes there, he realized that what this Institute for Sexual Research was was basically a bordello, homosexual bordello. He said that in his memoir. Goodbye to Berlin. Uh, it eventually got made into a uh, movie, a musical called Cabaret. So this is the situation in uh, in Germany at this point. And this is the Weimar Republic. It's basically a, a Jewish takeover uh, of Germany at a moment when it's completely weakened. There's also an economic element going on here because the British uh, decided that they were going to destroy Germany financially. Uh, and the man who rose up uh, and tried to deal with this was Hjalmar Schacht, uh, one of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century, financial geniuses. He uh, basically orchestrated uh, a loan from the Bank of England, which was collaborating with the Fed at this point, and uh, resurrected the economy. But the first thing he had to do before he could resurrect the economy was destroy the debt. And he destroyed the debt by instituting massive inflation. And that's the famous inflation where they're carrying Reichsmarks around in wheelbarrows. It was done deliberately to because uh, inflation is the way you get out of debt. That's what he did. And then they started uh, with the uh, gold standard. Uh, at this point, the, uh, the an animosity toward Germany is growing. The Jews are heavily involved in it. There is an out by the 1930s, after Hitler takes power, after 33, the Jews declare war on Germany. There's head headlines you can see about this. And this led to a reaction, again, a violent reaction uh, known as Kristallnacht, where uh, Nazi uh, thugs uh, broke the windows of uh, Jewish businesses. Now, David Irving makes a, a number of claims about this. He said that Hitler was upset by the excesses of Kristallnacht, didn't agree with it. But whatever it was, it got hu a huge amount of negative publicity uh, uh, to the point where uh, Father Cochlin, the American priest, the radio priest, uh, gave a famous speech in which he said, uh, basically, uh, if you're going to hold you to addressing the Jews, if you're going to hold uh, Christianity and Catholicism in particular as responsible for Kristallnacht, then we will hold you responsible for the Bolshevism that created Kristall, Kristallnacht in the first place. So you have this contentious situation that basically uh, Hitler resolved by force majeure, by simply abolishing the Weimar Republic when he came to power in 1933. Now, this intensified the ally, the British uh, animosity toward uh, Germany. At the time when there are large segments of the American population, and I'm talking about America first, that political movement, 
that simply felt that the whole idea of getting involved in World War I was a disaster and they didn't want to get involved in another war in Europe. And they were a potent political force in the United States at that time. At the same time, uh, the, the uh, British are putting the squeeze on ger the German economy. Uh, they're, they're cutting out the loans. They're cutting them out. It's, it's basically the same thing that the United States is doing to Russia at this point, uh, trying to freeze them out of economic exchange. And at this point, Helmar Schach comes back into power. He'd been out of power. Hitler brought him back. He, Schach really didn't want to work for Hitler, but he brought him back anyway. And this time, he, he created really what was a, a true economic miracle by basically restarting the German economy with no gold. He didn't borrow a, a one piece of gold. He did it basically because he understood the basis of wealth, which is human labor. And if, if he could mobilize German labor uh, using money the government, that government issued as a guarantee of future German labor with the backing of the state, then he could resurrect the economy. And that's exactly what he did. This was the, the we're in the middle of the depression now. This is what Roosevelt should have done. And he never had uh, the political will or the intelligence to do it. He had half half hearted measures like the WPA and things like that. We're trying to inject money into the economy, but he was crippled because of his background. And uh, they didn't, uh, the, that uh, ruling class, New York ruling class that he came from, uh, were bankers and they didn't believe you could do this. You could use government to inject money into the economy. Shocked did it in Germany with things like the Autobahn. Basically a huge government project that was the basis uh, model for our interstate highway system did it purely uh, through political means. In other words, put all these Germans to work, pumped money into the economy, and the economy took off. And that uh, paved the way for uh, German, the, the re restoration of German industry, which had uh, uh, basically been uh, captured by the Allied powers, especially France. Uh, Hitler basically marched into the Ruhrgebiet and just took it over. And now we had German industry and they started producing weapons and then that led to World War II. That's, uh, in a nutshell, my understanding of uh, the Weimar Republic and how it led from World War I to World War II.